Here we go. So um, basically what I did, you guys, was just, I went through that um, study guide that they gave us with all the bullet points that wasn't very detailed. And um, I just went to the textbook and basically copied the information here. So it's a lot of information. Um, if you guys have anything to add or, um, you know, have any other information that you'd like to share, then please just jump in and um, with that information. Um, let me see if I can minimize this. Okay, let's do that. Um, so um, I just took this information from the study guide, you know, information in the red letters and the appendices at the end of the chapters may include test items. So uh, I included some of that information in here, but you know, be sure that you're looking at that. And then being familiar with the techniques of examinations and recording your findings for all body systems. And then just some test taking strategies. I know, you know, this isn't new information for most of us after, you know, passing the NCLEX and passing all the exams that we've passed here, but you know, making sure that you're not rushing, you're reading the questions carefully, rereading them if you need to. Um, don't miss select all that apply. I think you have to watch out for this and exemplify because I think I missed that on the one of the exam questions or the quiz questions. Um, so just making sure that you're looking out for that. And then they have that elimination tool to cross out the answers you know are wrong for sure. Um, and then if you don't know the answer, try to use context clues and prefixes to guide you. Um, and then, you know, trying to answer the question before you read the options. And then if you can answer it in your head and then you find your answer is an option, then that's it. Um, avoiding fact traps. So like an answer might actually factually be true, but it doesn't answer the question that you're being asked. And then watching out for switchbacks, uh, words like although, nonetheless, despite, because those are sometimes used to trick you. Um, so starting with chapter one, uh, the interviewing process, you know, initiating the encounter, uh, gathering information, uh, performing the physical exam, and then explaining and planning. That's the general sequence. And then uh, interviewing techniques, making sure that you're beginning with open-ended questions, like how can I help you today? What brings you in? Um, and then invite the patient to share information and don't interrupt them. Um, Setting the stage for the exam, you know, prepare for the interview, kind of, uh, you know, look through the chart if that's available, um, kind of have some basic information and ideas before you go in, check your appearance, make sure the patient's comfortable, check your environment, so making sure that, you know, that, um, you're providing privacy and that the, um, you know, the room's not too cold or too hot, something like that. And then reflect on biases you may have before you go into the room, so um, those aren't clouding your judgment. Um, introduce yourself, your role, and how you will be involved in their care. Uh, gender pronouns, that's kind of a newer thing in the last couple of years, but um, basically asking the patient which pronouns they prefer and you know, saying that we're doing that for their inclusion, um, and then even sharing which pronouns you prefer can make them more comfortable. Um, and then patient-centered care, basically, uh, looking at how it, how everything affects the patient. So, you know, they might be there for, I don't know, like knee pain or something, but um, seeing how that affects their entire life, like their, you know, their knee pain might be their primary problem, but they're not able to work or they're not able to take care of their kids or something like that. And then if there's other people present, make sure to ask the patient if it's okay to do that exam with that person present. And then Try to find out who that person is. Don't like make an assumption like, oh, is this your mother? And then find out it's their sister or whatever. Does anybody have anything to add to that? Or I don't have anything to add, Amber. This is Shamira. Hey. If you wanted to, I wanted to catch you before you started. If you wanted to make me a co-host, that's fine. So I can okay. admit people while you're talking. Oh, okay. Um, just so you don't have to do the two. If you know how, if not, then let me see um, if I can do that. Uh I go here and then make the host. How's that? Oh, does that work? 
Yes. Yep, I got it. Okay. So yeah, okay. So I'm trying not to spend a lot of time on this stuff because you know I think exam questions on this are going to be like pretty straightforward and kind of obvious. Um, but you know it's on the study guide and there are some important points to uh, think about. Um, and the Fife model was on there. So that's exploring the uh, patient's perspectives, their, you know, their feelings, fears or concerns, ideas about the cause of the problem, um, effect on their function and their expectations of the disease or clinician. Uh, you wanna find out what those are from the patient because a lot of times their expectations uh, might not be realistic. So um, that's just exploring more about the patient. Um, <clears throat> and I tried to put page numbers on here. So if you guys need to go back and reference it, um, most of the stuff has page numbers to see where, uh, where all of this came from. So, you know, interviewing techniques, again, I didn't really like put definitions on here because I think the name of the interviewing technique kind of gives an idea of, of what, it, um, what it means. So, you know, like empathetic responses, you're showing empathy to the patient saying, you know, that must be scary for you. Um, with summarization, you're, you're basically summarizing what they've told you to make sure that you've understood it. Um, um, partnering with the patient. So like saying like, how can we work through this together? Uh, validating, like I, I can see that you're upset or I can see that you're scared. Um, so things like that. And then um, verbal communication. So using understandable language, not like uh, not like a lot of medical jargon that they can't understanding. And then this showed up in the text a couple of times using non-stigmatizing language like people first. So you don't wanna say like disabled people, you, you'd like to say people who use a wheelchair or something like that. And then ask me three is a good way of uh, confirming teach back, confirming that the patient understood what you said. So if the patient can answer these three questions, what is my main problem? Oh, I have diabetes, what do I need to do? Take my insulin. Why is it important for me to do this? You know, so I don't get complications of diabetes and you know, neuropathy and diabetic ketoacidosis, things like that. And then uh, nonverbal communication plays a big piece in how we're um, communicating with people. So making sure that you're doing eye contact, not just like staring at the computer. Mm -hmm. Posture plays a, a big role, your tone of voice, um, use of silence, use of touch, things like that. Mm -hmm. And then this uh, was the, you know, challenging patient situations. I think that was like our week two discussion. So just know that those are patient situations that you could come across and kind of uh, what sort of ways to deal with them. Um, being direct with the patient is is a good way to deal with a lot of these. Um, and then on the health history, there's you know the comprehensive versus focused. So comprehensive is when you're seeing the patient for the first time. Focused, patient has specific concerns and they're an established patient. So you already know with some details about them, you know, their past medical history and surgical history and all of that. Um, and then these are the things that are included in the comprehensive health history. Uh, initial information, uh, chief complaint, why the patient is there, the history of present illness, when did it start, the events surrounding, past medical history, family history, social history, which, you know, that includes your sexual activity, tobacco use, drug use, alcohol use, um, education and work. And then the review of systems is just like a presence or absence of common symptoms in each body system. So you could just ask them like, a couple easy questions like, you know, for GI, if, uh, you know, are you having nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, things like that? And if they say no, then you can just put negative for the review of systems. Um, any questions or comments so far? Anything anybody want to add to anything that we talked about that they have? 
um, read, found that was helpful to remembering any of the information or anything like that, like test taking strategies, techniques, skills, anything like that? Or everybody good? You guys can come off of mute and say that if so. Yeah, and at any point, just feel, feel free to interrupt if you have something to add or, um, you know, any questions, just, just interrupt. Um, the, the health history, um, again, so included in the adult illnesses, you want to get their medical illnesses, diabetes, hypertension, asthma, hospitalizations, et cetera, and then surgical. Um, make sure you get the dates because, you know, like say if they have like an appendectomy 20 years ago, that probably isn't too, too relevant. Um, or, you know, if they had like, a, I don't know, like a bowel resection six months ago, and now they're coming in, you know, vomiting, then the, uh, the date six months ago is probably pretty relevant. And then the, um, if they've had any pregnancies, so a number of pregnancies, and then the, the para is like the term preterm abortions, living children, and then psychiatric illnesses, including diagnosis, hospitalizations, treatments, and medications. And you should also ask, um, you know, not just say like, do you have psychiatric illnesses? Like maybe ask them specific things like, have you ever been diagnosed with anxiety or depression? Or are you taking medications for those? Because a lot of times patients don't consider psychiatric illnesses as, um, as, you know, anxiety or depression. So maybe asking like some specific questions. And then I think we're all pretty familiar with this, you know, the attributes of the symptoms. I think this course is more into the old carts thing, um, you know, so asking when the symptoms started, where exactly is it happening? How long has it um, been going on for? What does it feel like? Does anything make it better or worse? Does it radiate to different parts of the body? Um, the timing, like, does it come and go or is it constant? And then the setting, um, you know, like when does this usually occur? And then um, subjective versus objective. So subjective is what the patient tells you and those are symptoms. And then objective are things that you can see. So they're, you know, physical exam findings, lab um, or exam results, things like that, things that you can actually see. So, you know, things like this, uh, headache and fatigue would be things that the patient tells you. So they're subjective. Um, tenderness on palpation, does anybody have any ideas? Because I was thinking it could kind of be both. I mean, the patient's telling you that it hurts, but also too, you can see like if they're grimacing, um, then that would be like an objective finding. And it's then, Sarah, I, I would say that those are definitely both. Yeah. You know? Well, that's kind of what I was thinking too. Like, um, it's it's hard to say. So, like, if they ask you that on an exam question, I guess that could be kind of tricky. Like, the patient's yeah. telling you that it's hurting, then it's um, you know, then it's um, subjective. But if you can see like physical signs of pain, like they're grimacing or they're pulling away, then then that would be objective. I agree. I think it'll depend on how the questions laid out, if it's even that complicated on the test. Yeah, I, yeah, I would hope not. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. <laughs> and then um, other things that would be objective would be like, uh, you know, positive influenza tests or blood pressure, or heart rate, um, the shortness of breath, that's definitely um, subjective. You know, the patient's telling you that they're short of, but if you can see that they're working to breathe or, you know, they're in respiratory distress and that's objective. And um, same thing with diarrhea, like if the patient tells you that, then it's subjective. But if you actually see it, then it, it's subjective, you know? I think we got that. <clears throat> um, this was on the study sheet too. It was also like modifying for various clinical settings. You know, an ambulatory care is the best setting because the patients are low acuity. And so you can ask about chronic health conditions and they're generally, you know, alert and oriented and cooperative um, versus like in the emergency room, you might have to stabilize the patient first before you start asking them like if they have a family history of diabetes or whatever. Um, you might be interrupted just because of the way the emergency room is set up. Um, and you may need to ask the family or look at the chart 
if the patient's you know not stable or or not alert enough to answer the questions. Same thing in uh, intensive care. You're generally getting your information from chart review and family members, um, just because uh, most of the patients, you know, they're either sedated or you know unresponsive on ventilators, whatever. So there's that. And then the nursing home, you want to ask about their ADLs, so like their activities of daily living, um, if they're able to dress themselves and feed themselves and take themselves to the bathroom. Not IADLs, which are your independent activities of daily living. Um, that's things like grocery shopping and driving and balancing your checkbook. Um, obviously, you know, people in nursing homes are going grocery shopping. Um, and then the home environment is nice because you're also able to assess the home environment for safety, um, like hazards, anything, like if they have a smoke detector, things like that. Um, Can I interrupt for a second? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Please do. <clears throat> Um, so going back to the subjective versus objective, mm -hmm. when we were talking about the tenderness on palpation, on page 79 of the book, it says, while tenderness on palpation of the anterior chest is an objective sign. So I would just say that if you, it's elicited during an exam, it would probably be more objective. Okay. Yeah, I guess I would agree with that, especially yeah. if the book says it. Yeah, so it's um, on page 79 if someone wanted to reference it, but. Okay, cool, thank you for that. Sure. Um, and then, so we're on chapter four here. So the three goals of the physical exam are like to maximize the patient comfort, um, avoid unnecessary changes in position and enhance clinical efficiency. So you wanna make sure that the patient's comfortable and then you don't wanna be like playing Simon Says with them. Like I'm gonna have you lay down and now I'm gonna have you sit up and now I need you to lay down again. Um, so kind of, um, you know, directing your assessment in a way that makes sense. So you're not going to have the patient back and forth um, and then enhance clinical efficiency. So, you know, getting your information basically, you know, as fast as possible without, um, without being too inefficient. Um, so it's kind of similar to uh, getting the history and physical there's comprehensive versus focused. So if you're doing a physical exam that's focused, it would be the targeted problem with the patient's chief complaint is. And then the comprehensive would be like a head to toe. Um, you just said one of the benefits of that is it strengthens the clini clinician patient relationship, I suppose, because you're spending more time with them. And you know, I think patients get a perception that you're more thorough when you're doing a comprehensive versus just a targeted. And then the techniques of examination, um, you know, inspection you see with your eyes, palpation is tactile pressure. So you're feeling for lumps, contours, depressions, crepitus, and then percussion is the actual like tapping on different uh, body systems to kind of evoke sounds of either dullness or resonance. Um, the abdomen and the lungs are typically what we're using percussion for. Um, so you're using your middle finger. It's actually your middle finger on both hands. So you're putting one finger on the organ and then you're, you're using the other middle finger to tap it to evoke a sound. Um, and there's some videos like the Bates videos show you pretty good examples of how to do that. And I kind of feel like it takes a lot of practice. And then auscultation, using the stethoscope to hear lungs, heart, bowel sounds, et cetera. Um, in the abdomen, it's important to auscultate before you do any palpation or percussion so that the bowel sounds aren't falsely stimulated. Um, and then this is just a general um, head to toe, like order of the physical exam. And that's basically it. You know, you're starting at the head and, and going down from there. There is a... Um, there's a box on page 125 that shows you like which position the patient should be in for all of these body systems. Um, does anybody have questions about this? Like, I don't think that this is new. We're like all nurses. I think this is kind of um, not new information or am I wrong about that? Like I kind of feel like probably 
when we were at nursing school, this is how we get head to toe assessments. I mean, obviously we weren't doing them as in depth or, you know, not necessarily doing like rectal and genital exams and things like that. But I think it's pretty obvious when you say head to toe, which order you're kind of going in. <clears throat> yeah, Amber, I think you're good there. The only thing that I was going to point out that it, I feel like it kept emphasizing was that making sure that you keep your genital and rectal exam to the end mm -hmm. um, and making sure that you include if it is a female examination that there is a um, another nurse a nurse or someone present oh like a chaperone yep a chaperone so those okay. are the two things that I think they may touch on um I believe that was read in the text as well. So just remembering those two things is all I wanted to add to that. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, hey, Emba, I was also going to add something. Sure. Um, so for the for the pediatrics, to remember to uh, you know to assess invasive um, assessments at the end also because you don't want to upset them before you. Do that so you can do everything else and then you if they are coming in with their ear pain or you right. need to look into their eyes then you can set that at the end yeah do that last so you don't upset them and miss the rest of your assessment that's yeah that's a good point um and i haven't really seen in the book like a lot of uh you know like them saying like well these are variations for pediatric populations or like special population considerations but um yeah good point uh, clinical reasoning process. This is like, just how do you come up with your differential diagnosis? And um, there's a, you know, the whole chapter goes into it about how you use your knowledge, the context and experience um, combined to generate a hypothesis. Um, and the basic structure is that you gather initial patient information, you organize and interpret it to synthesize a problem. And then you generate a hypothesis until a working diagnosis is selected. Um, and like an example that I have of that is that I, um, so like I'm a rapid response nurse at my hospital. And so I get called to evaluate patients for all kinds of things. But one thing was uh, I got called for was chest pain. And the nurse calls me saying this patient's having chest pain. Um, and I open the chart and it's a 33 year old patient who's like, um, you know, normally healthy, and had laparoscopic surgery six hours ago. And so as soon as I see that, I'm kind of ruling out, like she's probably not having an MI given like her age and her history and all of this. And I know that when patients have laparoscopic surgery, you know, when they put the air in the abdomen, it can sometimes like irritate these nerves and it can actually cause them to have chest pain. So I'm kind of thinking it's probably just from the surgery. And then, um, the nurse was concerned. She was like, well, is it possible that it could be a pulmonary embolism? And I was like, yeah, it's possible, but not likely, you know, given that she doesn't have any other risk factors. She's not tachycardic. She's not hypoxic. So it's basically using your knowledge of everything and kind of combining it together to think what's actually going on here. Um, and then this was a like kind of a mnemonic to kind of uh, pare down your differential diagnosis. So, you know, these, if you get, get any single problem, you could, um, you could maybe rule all of these out. So, you know, looking, is, it, is there a vascular cause for this problem? Could it be infectious? Could it be cancer? Could it be drug related? Um, could it be inflammatory or idiopathic, meaning like we don't know what's causing it, congenital, um, autoimmune, trauma, toxic, endocrine, or metabolic. <clears throat> um, okay, and then this is the same thing. It's um, your problem statement. So after you've come up with your, you know, working diagnosis, your assessment and plan, you basically, you're trying to prove your point in your summary statement. So you're going to use a bunch of different context clues to uh, kind of put together what you think the problem is. Um, so, you know, putting the chief complaint in context with the overall health, um, including pertinent lab history or physical findings, you want it very succinct and short, and uh, it basically demonstrates your cl clinical reasoning skills. 
and then makes the case for the diagnosis. So like the example it gave here was a, a 57 year old man with CHF and 35 pack years uh, smoking history presents with acute severe retrosternal pain and shortness of breath. Exam notable for S4 gallop, biphasal or crackles and bilateral extremity edema. So you're taking all of this information and putting it into your little sentence and they're all clues, right? So we all know that what's going on here is probably like a CHF exacerbation. And this guy's fluid overloaded. Not that, you know, like he's probably not having like a COPD exacerbation because it's giving you all this information that he's fluid overloaded. Questions or comments? Okay. Um, and then this was another thing, like using semantic qualifiers, using uh, words like acute or chronic can really change, you know, the context of what you're talking about or at rest or with activity. So, you know, if something's hurting at rest, then it might give you a different idea of what's actually going on with the patient or if it's constant or intermittent or if it's mild or severe, you know, so if somebody comes in with like acute at rest, constant severe chest pain, that's a little bit more concerning than if they have like chronic intermittent mild chest pain, right? Um, so using words like that can really make your, um, your clinical statement more effective. Um, and then the patient problem list includes all the patient problems, most active, most serious first. Um, and serves as a reminder to follow up on subsequent visits. I think, um, I think on this last like eye human case, uh, a lot of us didn't put the uh, you know the birth control on Amanda as like an as a problem list. But um, certainly, like you know, if somebody comes in with a sore throat and then they have like a high BMI, you want to put their high BMI. In the, in the problem list, even though it's not really pertinent at this visit, but then when they come back, you could be like, oh, you know, let's talk about your weight or, you know, things like that. Um, but typically the chief complaint is first. And then um, evaluating clinical evidence um, for uh, validity. So like, does the test accurately determine uh, whether a patient has a disease that compares against the gold standard. Um, and then sensitivity is the, pro the probability that a person with a disease has a positive test. So one thing I think about are these, um, you know, like these over-the-counter COVID tests. So um, I think they have like an 80% um, sensitivity. So if you take a COVID test and you have COVID, then there's like an 80% probability that the test will be positive. And then um, specificity, uh, sorry, I can't say it. Specificity is the probability that a non-diseased person has a negative test. And um, so one of the things like in this example here, um, jaundice and rebound tenderness are not consistently found with cholecystitis. So that's sensitivity. And then if there's jaundice and rebound tenderness, you still need to consider other diagnosis, which is the specificity. Meaning, you know, if there's jaundice and rebound tenderness, it doesn't just mean one thing. So are there questions about that or anything to add? Okay. <clears throat> um, and then this part was in chapter seven. It's just about how to, you know, communicate clinical evidence to patients. Uh, and then there was this part about the five A's, um, which I didn't actually know what it meant and the textbook really doesn't go into it. It just said use the five A's. Um, so this was an example that I found. So you wanna um, ask, like this is about smoking cessation. So you wanna ask the patient at every, at every visit if they, you know, if they wanna uh, quit smoking or whatever, and then you should advise them to quit smoking um, and then assess if they're willing to quit. If they are, then you provide them assistance and then you arrange follow-up contact, uh, preferably within the first week after the quit date. Um, I, I don't necessarily believe that that'll be tested. Okay. 
Uh, okay, and then we get into chapter eight, which is general survey, vital signs and pain. So general survey is basically just looking at the patient, you know, like what their skin color looks like, how are they dressed, are they well-groomed, what's their um, mood, uh, posture, gait, like that. So just even by looking at the patient before you even talk to them or touch them or lay a stethoscope on them, it's just your general, how you think about the patient. Um, and vital signs, obviously height, weight, blood pressure, pulse, temperature, respiratory rate, and then uh, pain, acute versus chronic, and then using the old carts to evaluate that. Uh, BMI, I don't know if you guys saw that, um, that question or the test questions that the instructor sent out. I posted it in the group last night, but, um, and it had some kind of practice questions, but no real answers, but um, it looks like BMI could be a topic of discussion. So kind of knowing what these normal um, ranges are for the different- I, I have a- Sure, go ahead. I have a question. I struggled um, with uh, how to do the blood pressure in the eye human. Oh yeah. Can, any, can anybody can anybody show me how to get vitals on the eye human? Because I couldn't figure it out whatsoever. Okay. Um, yeah, I could probably show you. Um, with the you mean with the like part that you blow up? Yeah, yeah. I I I blew it up. I pressed the I can never say it with this this spig spig yeah. uh -huh. And then I was I was listening I was listening for the sound where you know because I do manual pressures at work, so I was listening for the sound where you can actually hear the um the pulse come back. And I couldn't hear it, and I didn't want to lie on a blood pressure. But then I got points taken off for not putting a blood pressure. Oh, so really? I was just like, I couldn't hear. I couldn't hear it. I don't know what I was listening for. So I was just wondering if there was like a special trick to it. Um, because I thought uh, this, I, the sounds were very faint on the eye human, and so I think maybe using um, like headphones might help. Because um, okay, I heard them, but yeah, they were. They were really hard to listen for. I agree. Yeah, my kids were screaming at the time, so I probably didn't hear. I probably didn't hear. <laughs> yeah. And then the the heart rate and the um and the I know they provided pulse ox, but was there a special place to get the heart rate? Um, I think from just the radial pulse. Awesome. Okay, great. Thank you. Sure. Um, oh, here we go, blood pressure. So uh, normal ranges, so it's normal if it's if the systolic blood pressure is less than 120 and the diastolic is less than 180. It's elevated if the systolic is between 120 and 129 and the diastolic pressure are less than 80. Um, and then when you get into stage one and stage two hypertension, it doesn't have to be and, it's or. So it, you know if the systolic is 130 to 139, or the diastolic pressure is 80 to 89, and that's considered um, stage one hypertension. So they could be like uh, 120 over 89, and because their their diastolic pressure qualifies them for stage one hypertension. And um, same thing with stage two hypertension. Um, it's a systolic greater than 140 or a diastolic greater than 90. So it's not both, it's one or the other. So if your diastolic is greater than 90, then it's stage two hypertension. Um, the white coat hypertension is when you have elevated blood pressures in the clinic setting, but they're otherwise normal. And then masked hypertension is when your office blood pressure is normal, but their home blood pressure is elevated. And so sometimes asking patients to keep uh, blood pressure logs at home can help you, um, help you catch that, especially like with masked hypertension, because if they're coming into the office and you think everything's normal, but really they're running high at home, um, you know, that's a big risk for, for it being missed. And then respiratory rate and rhythm. I always thought it was 12 to 20, but apparently it's 12 to 25 is normal. Um, less than 12 or greater than 25 is considered abnormal. Um, it should be regular. So your inspiration should be as long as your expiration, but like in things like COPD, you'll have a prolonged expiration. And then you should have like a quiet, regular pattern. Um, there's a chart in the book that shows like the different 
different irregular patterns, like when you get Kussmaul's respirations or, you know, periods of apnea, things like that. Um, let's see, acute and chronic pain. So acute pain is uh, less than three to six months in duration, and it's usually associated with surgery, trauma, or illness. And then chronic pain is not associated with cancer or other conditions that last for more than three, three to six months, or uh, it's recurring at intervals of months to years. Um, and then there's different types of pain. So there's like the somatic pain, which is, you know, skin, musculoskeletal, or visceral. Um, the sensory nervous system is intact, and people will usually describe this as dull, stabbing, pressing, or throbbing, whereas neuro neuropathic pain is, uh, you know, it's usually uh, affecting the, the nervous system. And so you'll get descriptions like it's shock-like, stabbing, burning, pins and needles, things like that. Um, cognitive uh, techniques of examination. So you want to look at their appearance, behavior, uh, level of consciousness, um, speech. You want to note their rate, fluency, and articulation if they're talking really fast. Like a lot of times that could be indicative of like, um, oh, what is that? Like schizophrenia. Um, or if they have slurred speech, you know, could be concerning for some kind of neuro problem. Uh, note the mood, like if they're sad, anger, euphoric, um, thoughts, illogical versus illogical, or if they're having any perceptions like illusions or hallucinations, um, passing their insight, judgment, and cognition. So orientation and memory, short-term and long-term. Um, so um, <clears throat> let's see, lethargy, they're drowsy, but uh, they open their eyes when spoken to and fall back asleep. And then uptundation, this one, I guess was kind of new for me because I always thought when people wrap their eyes to touch and they're slow to respond. And then stupor only arouses to painful stimuli and then coma unarousable with eyes closed. Um, anybody have anything to add there? Um, speech patterns. Uh, so this is difficulty with language. So when you have uh, broca aphasia, that's they're able to comprehend you, but they're um, they have difficulty speaking. Whereas with Wernicke's aphasia, they have impaired comprehension but normal fluency of speech. And then I think um, something that got highlighted was. If they can write a correct sentence, they don't have aphasia. So like, even if they're not able to talk, if they can write a complete sentence, then there's no aphasia. And then um, there was some thought process abnormalities. There's a whole list of them there on page 256, like flight of ideas and neologems, just kind of weird, um, weird speech things. Um, Abstract thinking. So I guess you can actually test for this. Um, so you should ask your patient like what a proverb means, like don't count your chickens before they hatched or um, ask for similarities between a cat and a mouse. So like for the cat and mouse, they both are animals as abstract, but they both have tails as concrete. And so concrete responses are typical with intellectual disability, delirium or dementia. Mm. Screening for depression. There, so there's that uh, nine question health questionnaire that is pretty common, but there's two simple questions that are also effective. Um, you can just ask the patient over the last two weeks, have you felt down, depressed, or hopeless, or have you had little interest or pleasure in doing things? And those have a pretty high reliability of, you know, if they answer yes to one of those questions, then we should be further screening them for depression. Um, and then Substance abuse, all adults 18 years and older, including pregnant women should be asked about um, alcohol use, substance use and uh, misuse of prescription drugs. Um, it did say that there wasn't much benefit to asking like children about this. It's not necessarily recommended unless you have any um, concerns about it. Um, Oh, and then this is just hallucinations versus illusions. So hallucinations are perceptions that seem real. You're like seeing pink elephants on a wall, then that's a hallucination. Versus illusions are a misinterpretation of real external spaces. 
Okay, and then uh, chapter 10, the skin, hair, and nails. So the skin exam, it said seated, then standing. Um, hey, yeah, go right ahead. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, are we going to have access to these PowerPoints? Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to post it right after this. I'll post it on the, um, oh, okay. on the Facebook page, sure. Yeah. Um, and then the, the skin exam is then seated, then standing. Okay, then hair loss. Um, so note whether it's diffuse, patchy, or total. Um, and note that for your documentation. You know what I mean? Like if they have diffuse hair loss, it's pretty widespread, but it's not total. Or, you know, if they're losing hair in spots, then it's patchy. Um, there was the hair pull test, which was checking for treading from the roots. That's usually to do with like some kind of vitamin deficiency or something. And then the um, tug test also shows you how to do that. It's checking for hair fragility, usually seen in things like hypothyroidism. And then it said scarring of the scalp should be referred to dermatology for um, biopsy. So I think, you know, just knowing that that's an abnormal finding. And then um, there's that table on page 323 that goes through the hair loss examples. And um, I would just be familiar with all those pictures, like at the end of every chapter. I don't think you have to necessarily memorize every single one, but be able to look at it and say, this is what it is, you know? Uh, skin examination. So you should document what is present, not what is not present, um, if that makes sense. So don't say like, they don't have any moles or whatever. Um, unless it's really pertinent, you should just document like what you do find, because um, there's there's a lot of things. And so if you're documenting all these things that aren't present, then it kind of clouds the actual assessment. And then you should teach the patients to do regular uh, self-skin examinations. There's an example of how to do that, including like using a mirror to check their backside and things like that. And then the risk factors for melanoma are personal or family history of melanoma, more than 50 common moles, red or light hair, um, the solar antigones, which are the acquired brown macules on uh, sun exposed areas, UV exposure, either through tanning beds or heavy sun, light, or, uh, light eye or skin color, severe uh, sunburns in childhood or immunosuppression. Um, and then this is the ABCDE rule for melanoma. So obviously like if they're not symmetrical, they're kind of weird looking, um, or if the borders are irregular, kind of jagged, uh, any color variation. So if the mole is different shades in different areas, millimeters, or um, if it's evolving, like changing over time, then those are all concerns that, um, you know, patients um, should be checked for melanoma. And there's- uh, on um, For ahead. the ABCDE, I know that when I was reading, there is like a new acronym or whatever they are called. Melanoma, sorry. So don't be um, like, so you guys know if you do see that, they added the EFG, I mean, elevation, okay. sorry, firmness and growing. So if you do see those, those are um, additional that they add in melanomas. Okay. So it is two E's and then F and G. Okay. Like I said, if it's elevated, firmness and then growing. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah, so anything concerning, like definitely refer to dermatology to have it evaluated. Okay, uh, head and neck. So the lymph node assessment, um, that's on here, but also to this, uh, we have to do it for our week seven, you know, the video assessment that we have to do. So they're all labeled here. Um, so your submental are the ones that are under the chin the submandibular, which are along the jaw, the, you know, the mandible. And then there's pre-auricular, which is in front of the ear, post-auricular, which is behind the ear, um, tonsillar, which is kind of along the tonsil, the back of the mandible area, occipital is the back of the head. And then um, the anterior cervical are to the front of the sternocleidomastoid muscle, and then the posterior are to the back of the sternocleidomastoid mastoid muscle. And then supraclavicular is along the clavicles. Um, so you're wanting to assess the lymph nodes for any you know, nodules, tenderness, um, swelling, anything like that. And then um, 
the thyroid gland. Um, so you first want to inspect it. So observe the patient swallowing. You don't have to have them like drink water. Like people can swallow if you tell them to, even if they don't have anything. Um, and then palpate. This is another thing on a, a week seven assessment that they want you to do is to actually like verbalize what the anatomical landmarks are. So you want to find the cricoid cartilage, uh, which is at the top, and then the suprasternal notch, which is like at the bottom of the neck. And then in between those two anatomical landmarks is the thyroid isthmus, which is over the um, second, third, and fourth tracheal rings usually. And so you want to note the size, shape, um, consistency, like is it firm or soft, and then any nodules. Um, if it's super enlarged, you'll want to auscultate over the lateral lobes for any ruies. And then, um, so retrosternal goiters can actually cause hoarseness, um, dysphagia, or shortness of breath. So those are goiters that are like actually not growing out, but more growing in um, towards the, you know, towards the larynx and things like that. Um, more than 85% of goiters are benign, so nothing really to worry about. Um, in Graves' disease, your thyroid will be soft and nodular. In Hashimoto's disease, it'll be firm but not always uniform. Um, so not like firm throughout, it'll have areas of firmness. And then uh, malignancy, it's, it's typically firm. So like hard to the touch. And then um, the breweries are typically heard in Graves' disease or toxic multi-nodular goiters. And then if you have solitary nodules, um, ultrasound and possible biopsy, only 5% of nodules are malignant. <clears throat> Um, and then screening for thyroid cancer. So these are the risk factors. So if you've had any head or neck radiation, um, any relatives with thyroid cancer, um, any relatives with medullary thyroid cancer, those are risk factors. Um, and I think they said like, if you have a relative with thyroid cancer, like a first degree relative, it's like a 50% increased chance in getting thyroid cancer. And then, um, like I said, nodules are usually benign, but if they're greater than two centimeters, uh, firm and fixed, then those are concerning for malignancy. Um, <clears throat> so the extraocular muscles, we're onto the eyes now. The extraocular muscles are innervated by three cranial nerves, which is cranial nerve three, four, and six. Um, the ocular motor, trochlear, and abductions. Um, there's a table on 389. Uh, which shows what the paralysis of each looks like. And then these are concerning symptoms of the eye if they have any um, changes in vision, blurred vision, loss of vision, um, floaters, flashing lights, eye pain, redness, tearing, or double vision. Those are concerning symptoms. Um, oh yeah, so this is uh, just more about the, you know, those ocular motor, um, checking for extra ocular movements. So if you have a lesion of the oculomotor nerve number three, uh, you'll usually get like an eye when you're asking them to go side to side, one will get kind of stuck uh, and it's called down and out. So it's kind of down to the, to the left and to the side or to the right and to the side, you know. And then the, um, the trochlear nerve, if there's a lesion, it generally won't affect the eyeball position per se, but you'll usually have like double vision. And then the um, abductions, cranial nerve number six, um, it actually causes the eye to be adducted away from the midline. Um, <clears throat> and then this is the component of the eye exam. Um, you'll first want to test visual acuity with the Snell and eye chart. And then the visual fields, that's like where you wiggle your fingers behind them until they can see it. That's checking for the peripheral vision. Um, testing color vision, if you have a chart for that, um, checking the position or the alignment of the eyes, um, inspecting the eyebrows for fullness, scaliness, inspecting the eyelids for width, edema, color, uh, lesions, inspecting the um, conjunctivae and sclera. Um, the conjunctiva should be like pink, like no redness and no lumps, no masses, and the sclera should be white. Sometimes you'll see like redness, like, you know, if somebody's got pink eye or something, or um, you'll see jaundice, like you'll see it yellow if they're jaundiced. Um, those are the common ones. 
and then inspecting the cornea, iris, and lens, inspecting the pupils for size, shape, symmetry. They should be, you know, uh, round and equal, um, not huge and not pinpoint either. And then um, checking pupillary reaction with like a, with a pen light or a flashlight to make sure that the pupils constrict to light, that's normal. And then um, extra ocular movements. So doing like the H test, like having them follow your finger while you draw an H and then checking the eye movement side to side. And then the fundoscopic exam with the ophthalmoscope, which is here. Um, so when you look with the ophthalmoscope, um, you should see a red reflex, which is a normal or orange glow of the pupil. If it's absent, maybe due to a cataract or less likely a detached retina, um, or if they have like a fake eye or something like that, you won't see it. Um, I would know like this normal, what the normal one looks like. And then there's there's some um, different images on 393 and 394 for different, um, different pathologies. But if you have a enlarged cup, uh, that's typically seen with chronic open angle glaucoma. Um, papilla edema uh, is an emergency. It's caused by increased intracranial pressure. And you'll see the physiologic cup is swollen. And then um, like if you see the veins in that normal picture, normally those will pulsate. If they're not pulsating, um, sometimes that's indicative of papilla edema. So, um, and then the cotton wool spots are just like little white patches. Um, in the fundus. Those are usually due to like um, HIV, hypertension, diabetes. Uh, the drusen or yellow spots, those are typically due to normal aging. And then hard exudates, those are just like little fat deposits all over the, the fundus. And those are um, lipid residues from damaged capillaries, diabetes, or vascular problems. Comments or anything? Have an, anybody have anything to add? Um, so some more eye notes. Uh, nystagmus is the fine rhythmic oscillation of the eyes. A few oscillations on lateral gaze is normal. So like when you're having them do the side to side test, that's normal. Um, sustained nystagmus is um, seen in congenital disorders, cerebellar disorders, and drug toxicity. Um, acute uh, angle glauco uh, closure glaucoma. You'll have severe pain, uh, photophobia, the pupil will be fixed and dilated, the cornea is cloudy, and um, that's also indicative of an acute increase in intracranial pressure, which if that's an emergency. And then um, primary open angle glaucoma is a gradual loss of vision from the peripheral. Uh, risk factors include you know, people being over 65, African-American, diabetes, ocular hypertension, um, and then the retinal exam will show pallor and increased optic cup size. And then the um, patient should get periodic glaucoma testing around the age of 40. Uh, questions? Um, the Snell and I chart, you know, that's like the the letters and the lines, or you know, sometimes it's like the E's facing different ways. Uh, 20, 20 is normal. Uh, 20 over 80. So that what that indicates is that a person could see at 20 feet what a normal person could see at 80 feet. Um, and so you do the Snell and I chart from a distance of 20 feet. So the larger the bottom number is, the worse the vision is. And so you want to assess the left, right, and both eyes. Um, <clears throat> both eyes together, I mean. Um, and then common causes of visual impairment are usually cataracts, uh, which is caused by proteins breaking down in the lens and clumping together. Age-related um, macular degeneration, which is, it's just the retina degrading, and then diabetic neuropathy. With the cell and eye chart, you want to make sure that they wear their glasses too during that, correct? Yes, thank you. That's a good one, Kaylin. And then 20... Um, 100 is technically considered legally blind. Okay. So if you do see that somewhere, um, 20, 100 is legally blind. 
it says something about in the United States, but just so you know. Okay. Uh, that's what that's what both eyes, right? Because I'm like 2020 in one eye and 2200 in the other eye. But I'm, I don't know if this is both eyes. I, I, can look at <laughs> I think I'm legal. <laughs> I can see with both eyes. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, thanks for that. Yeah, extra, extra information. Um, so these uh, ears and nose, common or concerning symptoms, hearing loss, earache, discharge, uh, ringing in the ears or tinnitus, uh, dizziness and vertigo, nasal discharge, uh, which is also rhinorrhea and congestion, and then nosebleed or epistaxis. Um, okay. And then, so this is uh, list, uh, looking with the otoscope into the ears. So otitis media is the inflammation of the middle ear. So you can see it with the otoscope. And then our uh, otitis externa is the inflammation of the external canal. Um, and that's usually like swimmer's ear caused by moisture. Um, fever, sore throat, or cough heighten the suspicion for an ear infection. And then when you're examining the tympanic membrane, you wanna pull the article, which is like the, the big part of the ear. You wanna pull it up and um, back to kind of create a clear path so you can see. So if it's red and bulging, that's indicative of otitis media. And then if it has a amber color, like on the bottom, uh, that's known as an effusion. Um, and then if it's got like a little hole in there, then that's a, that's a perforation. And then there's more on uh, page 404 with different things that you might see. Does anybody have anything to add to that? Okay. Okay, screening for hearing loss. Um, so sensorineural uh, loss is usually due to problems with the inner ear, cochlear nerve brain. Um, and with this type of hearing loss, uh, you actually hear worse in noisy environments. So like in restaurants or um, you're always having to tell people to repeat themselves. And then in conductive loss, it's usually the external or middle ear. Um, and in this type of hearing loss, people can actually hear better in noisy environments. And then um, the whisper test is just basically where you're um, you know, having the patient cover one ear, you're whispering a series of letters and numbers over their other ear and having them repeat it back. And then um, you do the same on the opposite side. And then the tuning fork test, you'd actually have to have the tuning fork. Um, and then there's two tests. So there's the Weber test, which checks for lateralization. So you put it like on the top of their head and make it vibrate. And so if they have, um, Conductive hearing loss, the sound is heard in the impaired ear. And then if it's sensor neural hearing loss, then it's heard in the good ear. And then the RIN test is the same thing, you know, using the tuning fork, you kind of put it behind their ear and tap it till it vibrates. And then you pull it up next to their ear. Um, so when it's back here behind their ear, that's bone conduction. And when it's next to their ear, that's air conduction. So if the sound is heard in the bone uh, for the same amount or longer than the air, then it's conductive hearing loss. Um, but if they hear it in the air longer than in the bone, then it's sensor and neural hearing loss. Questions? Um, okay. And then the uh, nose and sinuses. So the sinuses that you can actually palp be palpated are um, the frontal and the maxillary. So the frontal ones are like on your forehead and then the maxillary are on the maxilla, um, which are below the eyeballs, right? Cause you have the mandible and then the maxilla. Um, and then there's a couple other sinuses but they're kind of stuck in there behind all those face bones which are the ethmoid and sphenoid. So you're not actually able to usually palpate those. <clears throat> Um, so there's different types of vertigo on page 413. Um, I just really wanted to point out that it's a spinning sensation and it's usually accompanied by nystagmus, which is the eyes going back and forth or ataxia, which is where you kind of get off balance. Um, it's due to, uh, inner ear problems or cranial nerve number eight. Um, and then this is kind of out of order, but the, and you want to inspect the nasal septum for deviation, 
inflammation, perforation, um, looking for any polyps or ulcers. And then um, tinnitus is the ringing or rushing sound in either one or both ears. It's often uh, accompanied by hearing loss and it's usually unexplained. And then rhinorrhea is a runny nose, usually viral, allergic, uh, vasomotor, could be drug induced due to decongestants or cocaine. Um, and then if tinnitus is associated with hearing loss and vertigo, you wanna suspect Meniere's disease. Um, any questions so far? Um, so the throat and oral cavity, common or concerning symptoms are sore throat, gum swelling, bleeding gums, hoarseness or bad breath. Um, and then this is the oral, of, or I mean, sorry, the order of the assessment. You wanna inspect the lips for color, moisture, cracking, inspect the oral mucosa for ulcers, discolorations, patches, um, palpate the oral mucosa if you see any lumps or anything like that. Um, inspect the gingiva for arrhythmia, uh, swelling. Inspect the teeth for any missing, cracked, decayed teeth. Um, inspect the roof of the mouth or the hard palate. And then you want to test cranial nerve number 12, which is the hypoglossal. Um, and that's checking for symmetry on tongue protrusion. So if you have your patient stick their tongue out, if it goes off to one side, then that's, you know, that's a lesion of cranial nerve 11. Um, inspecting the tongue for color, texture, lesions. If you see any lumps or bumps or swelling, you can palpate it. Um, inspect the soft palate, um, anterior and posterior pillars of the mouth. Um, the uvula, which is a little dangly thing, and then the tonsils and the pharynx. Um, and then you, you'll you test, test cranial nerve number 10, which is the vagus nerve. And how you do that is you just have the patient open their mouth and say, ah, and you're looking for symmetry of the uvula rising. Um, and then this is not from the textbook, but it was on the midterm guide. So tonsil grading system. So like if it's at a one, they have a full clear mouth. Um, two, you can see the tonsils kind of off to the side, kind of starting to come in, but by no means obstructing the airway. Um, grade three, there's this, you know, you still have a clear path here. Four, they're just about touching and then greater than four, they're um, overlapping and kind of blocking the airway there. In the review session we had with Amanda last mm -hmm. time, she did say, remember that grade zero to two are normal and then three and four are abnormal. Okay. So if that helps you, it is a grade zero. I know that's not on here, but grade zero is if they had a tonsillectomy. So they right. don't have any tonsils. Right. Um, yeah. But I just wanted to make everybody aware that zero to two, um, zero through two are all normal findings. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> uh, oral pharyngeal cancer, so risk factors are men older than 50, alcohol or tobacco use, um, and HPV. Um, this is only one example, but uh, it can appear as like a nodule or, or an ulcer or even red or white patches. So erythroplakia or leukoplakia, which is what this picture is. Um, so those are that. And now we're on to thorax and lungs. Um, so I just put the little diagram here, just to remember that there's three lobes on the right lung and two on the left. Um, and that, you know, the alveoli are the little microscopic air sacs that are the bottom. Um, so common or concerning symptoms, shortness of breath, dyspnea or wheezing, cough, um, blood streak sputum, such as hemoptysis, uh, chest pain, and then daytime sleepiness, snoring, and disordered sleep, which can um, indicate sleep apnea. And then this is how to locate the in, uh, intercostal spaces. I don't know if you guys saw that, but there was like a question on that practice exam about uh, something about the fourth intercostal space, I think, to put in a chest tube and how would you locate it? So how to locate it is you um, put your fingers on the suprasternal notch, which is at the very top. Of the, um, of the breastbone there. And then the breastbone is actually two uh, parts. It's the manubrium is the top part. And then the actual sternum is the bottom part. So where the um, 
manubrium joins the sternum. That's called the sternal angle or angle of Louis. And right next to that is the second rib. And then if you just walk your fingers down, that's the second intercostal space. So just some landmarks here. The second intercostal space is where you would do like a needle decompression for attention pneumothorax. Um, the fourth intercostal space is where test tubes are typically inserted. And then the fourth rib is like a landmark if you're checking for uh, ET tube placement, that's where the end of it should be. And then the uh, seventh intercostal space is where a thoracentesis would be performed. And then, so you'll want to do a survey, like just basic rate, rhythm, depth, effort of breathing, and then inspect the anterior posterior chest. So you're inspecting for any deformities like flail chest, anything like that. Um, palpating the chest for tenderness, uh, sinus tracts, expansion. So when you put your hands on the patient's chest, like they should be expanding equally on both sides. Um, fremitus, which is where you can actually kind of feel uh, breathing. I don't know if, if any of you have kids and like they've ever had a really bad cold and you can actually feel their breathing, kind of, kind of crunchy breathing, that's fremitus. And then um, percussing. Uh, the chest for flat, dull, tympanic, or hyperresonant sounds. Um, auscultating the chest for breath sounds, adventitious breath sounds, and transmitted voice sounds. And then the shape of the chest. So the, um, it goes into the anteropostural diameter. So the normal ratio is 0 0.7 to 0 0.75, and it can increase, increase up to 0 0.9 with normal aging. And then if it's greater than 0 0.9, it's probable COPD. So if they're, if the side of their chest is as wide as the front of their chest and they're kind of barrel chested, that's usually indicative of COPD. Um, they have more coming on some of those topics, but um, so no signs of severe respiratory distress. If somebody's not able to speak in full sentences, like if they're just sitting there on the bed and they're like having to catch their breath just to tell you what's going on, like they're running a marathon, then that's respiratory distress. Or if they're cyanotic, uh, using accessory muscles, usually like the neck or the intercostal retractions, um, they're basically having to use like every muscle that they have just to make their lungs move in and out. Um, Pulsus paradoxus is an exaggerated fall in blood pressure with inspiration. It's usually seen in cardiac tamponade, uh, severe COPD or severe asthma. And then um, the muscles of the rib cage are called the scalenes. Uh, and the primary muscle of respiration is the diaphragm. So when you uh, take an inspiration, that uh, diaphragm contracts and then it relaxes on expiration, kind of flattens out. <clears throat> um, this is another one of those questions that came up on that practice exam, um, which I think was this funnel chest, the pectus excavatum. Um, there's some examples of this on uh, page 481 in the text. Um, so uh, pectus excavatum is, I think, when the, um, the chest is kind of collapsed at the bottom. And then... Um, Atelectasis is complete or partial collapse of an entire lung or part of a lung uh, due to collapse of the alveoli. And then um, the pleural spaces. So the visceral pleural actually lines the lung and then the parietal pleura lines the pleural cavity. And in between those two is the pleural space. And sometimes you'll get patients that get pleural effusions which are accumulation of fluid in that pleural space. Um, transudates are usually, they're fluid related. So it's usually seen in heart failure, nephrotic syndrome or cirrhosis. Um, and then exudates are th things seen in like pneumonia, malignancy, tuberculosis, pancreatitis, pulmonary embolism. Um, and then irritation of this area is pleurisy, which causes pain on inspiration or pleuritic pain. Uh, but the lung tissue itself actually has no pain fibers. Um, this is an auscultation and percussion sites. So uh, you want to compare sites. So you don't want to go like down one side and down the other. You want to compare, you know, at the apexes, you want to do, you know, uh, the left or the right side and then the left side and same thing, just go across. 
and on the um, on the front part, the anterior part, it's six sites, but on the um, posterior site, it's actually eight sites altogether because you're getting down here in the bases. Um, let's see. That's a little picture of the breath sounds. So your crackles are usually- um, Amber, yeah. yeah, go right ahead. Sorry, may you please go back to the previous slide? Oh, sure, yeah. Okay, so in eye human, did you notice they had an extra spot close to the axillary? I did. So then how, I mean, like- I, I think it's this number, this number four, it's like the sides of the lungs. Uh, so the way it was on there, it was almost like you have the one, two, three, but then that it was almost like under the arms. So then I couldn't figure out whether I do one, two, three first and then go up to the axilla or uh, it, it kind of threw me off the way the diagram was presented in eye, in eye human. How did you all do it? Um, well, top to bottom. So I think, you know, if that, uh, I know what you're talking about, but if that like armpit side is on the bottom, then um, you would do those last before switching to the back side. Does that make sense? Because they were almost next to, you know, it was almost like they were between two and three, but almost under the armpit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I did those ones last. So I don't know if this is super helpful. I just Googled um, eye human breath sounds. And the first one is let's talk auscultation and images. Um, and it actually says eye human patient on the top right. So it shows you anterior, posterior, and then it'll show you the um, heart sounds too, in which order to listen to the heart sounds as well. Okay, thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. All right. I also, I also believe in eye human. Uh, there's that little question mark and you can hit it um, for help and it'll kind of go over like your breath sounds like which order you should auscultate and things like that. Oh, okay. Um, while you're in it, um, there is an area that you can find it in there. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Okay. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, our human's tricky because you got to do it exactly right or it it says you didn't do it. <laughs> I'll post the image that I found on the Facebook group too, if that helps. Yeah, that would be helpful. Thank you. Um, okay, yeah, so adventitious breath sounds. So um, like over here, it's got the crackles, which is usually like fluid pneumonia, um, CHF, and they're kind of, uh, they're not continuous, right? And then like more here in the middle, you have your wheezes that you see in asthma, COPD, and those aren't necessarily discontinuous and they're not necessarily continuous either. They're kind of in the middle. So you'll have some sounds on expiration and some on inspiration. And then your bronchi, which are suggested, but secretions in the large airway are more continuous throughout um, the respiratory cycle. Um, and then this was just some more, there's more information on page 461. So your um, vesicular sounds are soft and low pitched. They're longer on inspiration. The bronchovesicular, inspiratory and expiratory equal length. Um, bronchial sounds are, the expiratory is longer. And then the tracheal sounds are actually heard like over the trachea. Um, and then the transmitted voice sounds. So the whispered uh, pectoriloquy is when you ask the patient to whisper a sentence of words such as one, two, three, and then you listen with the stethoscope. And normally you can only hear faint sounds, but uh, over areas of tissue abnormality, the whispered sounds will be clear and distinct. And then um, bracophony, you ask the patient to say 99 in a normal voice and listen with the stethoscope. And uh, the normal finding is that you won't be able to hear the words, but if you do hear them, um, then it indicates a consolidation over that part of the lung. And then egophony, you just have the patient say E. And um, over normal lung tissue, you'll just hear E. But if the uh, lung tissue is consolidated, you'll hear an A instead of an E. Um, and then, so there was all this different stuff here about um, different pulmonary conditions, like it just said pneumonia, COPD, asthma. And so I think what they're looking for is what would a patient 
with these conditions present with. Um, so I just took this out of the chart on page 472, where there's dyspnea on exertion, uh, this is for heart failure, left-sided heart failure. You'd have dyspnea on exertion, orthopnea, uh, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, which is where they wake up like feeling like they can't breathe in the middle of the night. Um, sometimes wheezing, and typically they'll give you some kind of like history of heart disease in the patient scenario. Um, and then COPD would be like dyspnea on exertion, cough with scant mucoid sputum, and then they would in their history have some kind of like smoking or pollutant exposure. Um, asthma is typically acute episodes with symptom-free times, um, aggravating factors such as allergens, cold, or exercise, uh, wheezing, tightness in the chest, and cough. Uh, important note about asthma, if you have somebody who's, who you're suspecting like an asthma exacerbation and you don't hear anything when you listen to them, then that's actually pretty bad because that means that they're not moving air at all and that their airways are, you know, pretty, pretty well closed off. So, um, and then pneumonia, you would see like acute illness, uh, worse with smoking or exercise, they'll likely have pleuritic pain, cough, um, sputum, or fever. Uh, they won't necessarily have all of those symptoms, but that would that would raise your suspicion. Like if they're, you know, if they have a fever, then it's more likely pneumonia than a COPD exacerbation or something like that. Um, and then this is like a uh, percussion example. So like when you're doing the percussion, uh, what kind of sounds would you hear? So if you have flat sounds, uh, that could indicate like a large pleural effusion. If it's dull, could mean like a low bar pneumonia. If it's resonant, could be bronchitis. And then hyperresonant is one that I really think of like with COPD or pneumothorax, it's, it's more air. So it'd be super hyperresonant, almost like an echo because you're tapping on it and the air is just going and doesn't come right back to you. And then uh, tympanitic is just a large pneumothorax. Does anybody have anything to add or? <clears throat> Um, okay, we're getting there. Uh, cardiovascular. Um, so techniques of examination, you want to note the general appearance, blood pressure, heart rate. Um, estimate the level of the jugular venous pressure. You want to auscultate the carotids for breweries one at a time. While you're doing this, have the patient hold their breath so that the um, sound of them breathing doesn't doesn't interrupt um, your listening. And then you'll wanna palpate the carotid arteries, uh, including presence of an upstroke, timing, amplitude, and contour, and for presence of a thrill. And then inspect the anterior chest wall. Uh, a lot of times you can see the apical impulse right on the chest, uh, precordial movements. Um, you'll wanna palpate and locate the apical pulse or the PMI. Um, and to do this, you'll have the patient lay on the left side. Um, and then palpate for the systolic impulse of the right ventricle, pulmonary artery, and any aortic outflow tracts. Auscultate S1 and S2 in the six positions at base to apex. Identify physiologic splitting of S2 with respiration, and then identify systolic and diastolic murmurs. Um, I'll go more into that. Let me let my dog in. <clears throat> Okay. So I, um, I really like these like, um, you know, these like mnemonics to remember the different places. The other one that I heard before was uh, APE to MAN. So it's A-P-E-T-M. Um, your aortic is the only one that's on the right. So that's the right second intercostal space. And on the left second intercostal space is the pulmonic. And then Third intercostal space is herbs point. Uh, uh, the fourth intercostal space on the left sternal border is the tricuspid. And then the mitral valve uh, is heard in the left fifth intercostal space in the midclavicular line. Um, you'll wanna use the diaphragm to identify your high pitch sounds like S1 and S2, and then use the bell to identify low pitch sounds like S3, S4, mitral stenosis. So, um, you should listen to all five areas with the diaphragm and then with the bell. 
Um, the patient's head should be, their head and chest should be elevated at 30 degrees when you're initially listening to uh, heart sounds. And then the um, mitral stenosis S3 and S4 are best heard in the left lateral position. And then aortic regurgitation is best heard with the patient kind of leaning forward. Um, and then, so what causes the split S2 sound? So during inspiration, the right heart filling time is increased. So it uh, causes an increased right ventri ventricle ejection. Um, this delays the closure of the pulmonary valve. And um, this causes a normal or physiologic S2 splitting into two components. Um, and it can be heard at the second and third left intercostal spaces. Um, and then what causes the S3 heart sound? It's usually like fluid overload. So it's caused by rapid ventricular filling. Uh, it can be normal in people less than 40 or in the third trimester pregnancy. Um, and it's caused by ventricle overload. So uh, mitral regurgitation, tricuspid regurgitation, or um, systolic heart failure can all cause this S3 heart sound. And this is best heard in uh, when they're laying on their left side in the left lateral decubitus. And then the S4 heart sound is, uh, it's basically the left ventricle is stiff. So it's during active left ventricular filling uh, when the atrial contraction forces blood into a non-compliant left ventricle. And so the causes are usually diastolic heart failure, uh, left ventricular hypertrophy, um, or even active myocardial ischemia. Uh, but the important thing is, is if the patient has atrial fibrillation, the atria aren't contracting, they're fibrillating. So it's impossible to have an S4 sound if that's the case. So if you're hearing something else, then um, it's probably not it. Uh, and this is best heard at the apex with the patient in the left lateral um, decubitus. Um, and so this is really confusing to me, the, the apex and the, uh, the base. So the base of the heart is actually the top, which, you know, like when you listen to the lungs, it's backwards. So the, the top is the apex. And I think that's because that's where it points, right? But in the bottom of the heart is the apex. Uh, where your ventricles is. So that's your, your PMI, your point of maximal impulse. That's the apex of the heart is at the bottom of the left ventricle. And the base of the heart is actually the, the, the top, the aortic and um, pulmonic areas are the base. Um, questions, concerns, comments? Um, Okay, so with assessing the cardiovascular symptoms, common or concerning symptoms are chest pain, shortness of breath, including uh, dyspnea, orthopnea, which is difficulty breathing when you're laying down, um, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, which is like nighttime episodes of dyspnea that cause awakening, uh, palpitations, swelling, syncope, um, those can all be cardiac related. And then chest pain. So, you know, typical chest pain, like ischemic chest pain is described as dull, heavy, or crushing. Um, and it may also be like in the back or the jaw or the shoulder going down the arm. Um, but atypical presentations, especially in women and older people, um, could be more like indigestion, stabbing, burning, or with symptoms like nausea and fatigue. Um, and then there's a table there, chapter 16 on 16.1 that goes through the different types of um, pain and how they present. So like pleuritic pain is usually, you know, when you're taking a deep breath in, um, angina versus myocardial infarction, uh, pericarditis, costochondritis is usually, it's musculoskeletal pain. So it's reproducible when you press on the chest. And then GERD is more like a burning uh, over the esophagus. And then, okay, so anterior chest pain. So um, yeah, anterior chest pain, tearing and radiating to the back or neck are seen in aortic dissection. So that's concerning. Um, orthopnea and paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea are seen in left ventricular failure, mitral stenosis and obstructive lung disease. And then syncope often occurs to, uh, due to hypotension arrhythmias, and end-stage heart failure, um, and then heart murmurs. This, uh, like to me, it's, it's taking me a long time to get a hold of heart murmurs, so I would recommend watching YouTube videos. Um, I put a link down here to this one. It's like about four minutes long, um, and then, so yeah, this is what I was talking about, uh, murmurs heard 
uh, loudest at the base is the aortic. And so you would hear those in the aortic area. And then the murmurs heard at the apex, sorry, are usually mitral. Okay, go out that up. Um, so, yeah, so there's just some, some different, I think test questions do this a lot. They're like, oh, you hear like a mid diastolic murmur in the left sternal border. So, you know, if you kind of memorize kind of some of these descriptions of what murmurs are like, then that might help you on test questions. Um, this is another um, thing. Like you wanna uh, identify whether uh, murmurs are systolic or diastolic. So just remembering that diastole is a little bit longer than systole. Um, and so you'll have your S1 and then your S2 and in here is the, is the systolic or ejection murmurs. And then between S2 and the next S1, um, that's when your ventricles are filling, that's your diastolic murmur. So knowing which valves are open during which part of the cardiac cycle will help you uh, know what kind of heart murmurs you have. And then just another little diagram, you know, to just uh, distinguish between systolic and diastolic murmurs. So if you have a systolic murmur, which is when the heart is, you know, the left ventricle is contracting that systole, then uh, if you have an insufficient valve, uh, you know, it'll typically be the mitral or the tricuspid. And if you have a stenotic valve, it'll be the aortic or, or pulmonary. And then in diastole, it's exactly flipped. So your insufficient valves are your aortic and pulmonary. And then your uh, stenotic valves would be mitral and tricuspid. Um, so yeah, if valves are stenotic or calcified, um, main cause of mitral valve stenosis is rheumatic fever, secondary to strep infection, and then regurgitation is when the valve flaps don't close properly, and so uh, blood kind of leaks back, flip back into the other part of the heart. Um, uh, measuring JVP, that's like another kind of confusing thing. Um, you have to start with the head of bed at like 30 degrees. And then you raise the head of the bed until you see the jugular vein actually kind of pulsating. Um, and then you actually place kind of like a, a ruler at the sternal notch. And then you line up like a piece of paper or card or something with that pulsation. And however many centimeters that is, um, is your JVP. So it's elevated in right-sided heart failure and it's decreased in hypovolemia. So normal JVP is three to four centimeters and it's um, reflective of pressure in the right atrium. Um, so lifestyle modifications for cardiovascular health. Uh, I don't think that any of this is you know, real shocking news to any of us, but weight loss to achieve a normal BMI, low sodium intake, regular aerobic exercise, uh, moderate alcohol consumption to two or less drinks per day uh, for men and one or less drinks a day for women, a diet rich in fruits, vegetables, whole grains, low fat dairy, and then limit uh, consumption of high fat sweets or red meats. And then screening for cardiovascular risk factors, you want to screen fit for individual risk factors, um, you know, like obesity, diabetes, hypertension, things like that. And then calculate a 10 year and lifetime risk using a web based calculator, and then address those individual risk factors, the hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, um, family history you can't really do anything about, but you know, just uh, uh, making sure that you're addressing them. And then uh, lipid screening. So LDL is the primary target of cholesterol lowering therapy. Um, routine screening for men greater than 35, women greater than 45 years, 
uh, screen starting at age 20 if they have a history of diabetes, hypertension, um, obesity, or tobacco use, or family history of early cardiovascular disease. If it's greater than 190, they get an immediate statin, no matter what the risk factors are. Otherwise, it's stratified. So it's usually if they have positive risk factors uh, plus uh, LDL of 160, they'll usually get treatment. Um, anybody have anything? Or... Um, so this is how frequently you should be um, screening for cardiovascular uh, risk factors. So every visit you should screen for smoking, diet, activity, obesity, uh, pulse, and things like dyslipidemias and diabetes or you know, every five years for adults, 40 to 75, and every three years um, at age 45. And then peripheral vascular symptoms. So common and concerning symptoms are pain and swelling of the arms and legs, cramping in the legs on exertion with relief with rest, which is um, intermittent claudication, cold numbness, pallor, or discoloration in the legs, or any hair loss, abdominal flank or back pain. Um, and techniques of examination, you want to do the arms, um, inspect the upper extremities, palpate the upper extremities, including the pulses, the lymph nodes, uh, the abdomen, you want to palpate the lymph nodes, um, and then you want to check the aortic width and pulsation, you want to auscultate the abdomen for any bruises, aortic, renal, and femoral legs, you want to inspect the lower extremities, uh, palpate. So the pulses, the femoral pulse, popliteal pulse, dorsalis pedis, uh, posterior tibial pulse, and then check for temperature and swelling. And then um, measure the blood, blood pressure in both arms and palpate the carotid upstroke and auscultate for bruise. Um, this is just the arteries in the, in the leg. Um, I think one of those test questions asked, I don't know, for the anatomical landmarks of where you would check the femoral artery. So I think knowing the, the definitions of where they're actually located is kind of helpful because I always thought the femoral artery was the groin. So uh, if you know, like, you know, it's below the inguinal ligament midway between the, you know, anterior superior iliac spine and symphysis pubis in case they ask you that. Um, and then this is the lymphatic system. I think I saw a question about somebody came in with arm pain or arm swelling and which lymph node would you expect to be uh, swollen? So knowing some of the different locations of these lymph nodes in the arm, you've got these infraclericular uh, nodes, the axillary nodes, and the epitrochlear nodes, which are on the elbow. And then in the leg, really you could just do the superficial lymph nodes. You can't get some of these deeper ones, but the lateral, uh, medial, and vertical ones. And then edema. So bilateral causes are usually a systemic process. So like uh, elevated TSH and hypothyroidism, uh, increased BMP like in heart failure, increased creatinine, uh, liver disease, cirrhosis, those kind of cause global swelling. But if you have unilateral edema, it's usually due to something like a DBT, which is pitting. And then the lymphedema is non-pitting. Uh, typically accompanied by a history of surgery or malignancy, and then venous uh, incompetence, like venous, uh, venous stasis. So um, arterial versus uh, venous insufficiency. So arterial, you basically, you have no blood flow going to the leg or really limited. So you're going to have weak pulses, cool skin, won't be edematous. Um, because you're not getting circulation. A lot of times the skin will be shiny and you'll have hair loss there. And there's a potential for gangrene. Uh, whereas venous, you get blood down there, but you can't get it back up. So you're going to have no pain, generally normal pulses, pretty significant edema. You can get stasis dermatitis, which is like this purplish color of the legs. And then you can develop stasis ulcers, usually on the ankles or shin. And then, um, you want to screen for peripheral vascular disease in people over 65 or greater than 50 if they have history of smoking or diabetes, non-healing wounds, 
uh, leg symptoms with exertion, things like that. And then we're getting all these, okay. Um, and then uh, peripheral vascular system, the Berger test, this was just to check for um, arterial insufficiency. This isn't in the book anywhere that I could find, but it was on the study guide. So basically you're just lifting the patient's legs up to 90 degrees um, <clears throat> for up to two minutes until they turn kind of white. And then you ask the patient to sit up with the legs dependent, and then you uh, check how long it takes them to return to normal color. And then DVTs, you'll have um, calf asymmetry greater than three centimeters measured at 10 centimeters below the tibial tuberosity. Um, signs of a DVT usually include calf pain, swelling, edema. It's usually unilateral. Um, home inside is pain in the calf with dorsiflexion of the foot. Um, and if you have unilateral swelling of an upper extremity, it could be from like a central catheter or pacemaker. Um, other risk factors include immobility, like a long flight or car ride, oral contraceptive pills, malignancy, pregnancy. And then your risk for pulmonary embolism goes up about 50% with a proximal BVT. So you want to um, make sure, I mean, we should be anticoagulating these patients anyway, but if they do have a, a PE or a DVT, you want to let, let them know to let you know if they start having chest pain or shortness of breath and things like that. And then last thing is the abdominal aortic aneurysm. It's present when the infrarenal aortic diameter is greater than three centimeters. Uh, rupture in mortality increases greater than 5.5 centimeters. Additional risk factors include smoking, greater than 65 years old, coronary artery disease, peripheral artery disease, hypertension, and hyperlipidemia. And the task force recommendations are that men between the ages of 60 and 75 who've ever smoked more than 100 lifetime cigarettes get a one-time screening of ultrasound to ensure that they don't have a aortic aneurysm. But um, you know it's not recommended as in women because it doesn't really have it didn't show really much benefit for that. So I think that's pretty much it. Let's see here. So yeah, so my recommendations are just to watch the Beats videos. Uh, use the peer review study sessions that are in the peer support group in Canvas. Take the practice tests posted in the files. Um, look at the images in the purple tables at the end of the chapters for abnormal findings and what these look like. And that's the references. And then I guess that's it. Anybody got anything? Um, the the posted practice test. Mm -hmm. is, it, is it the same one that your professor sent you? Yeah, it's the same one she sent me and I posted it in the files in the group. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. um, I know that's a, a lot of information. It's like, you know, that was 600 pages worth of textbook reading. So it's really hard to, I think, know all of that. And um, I don't really have any advice other than kind of trying to just get get a general overview and do your best. <clears throat> um I'll post the I'll post the slideshow in the in the group um this evening. And then you know my contact information is in there. If you guys have questions, you can always call me or text me or whatever. Um, if I'm asleep, my phone's on silent, so you don't have to worry about waking me up. I'm always happy to help, you know. Um, I may not know everything because, you know, I'm right here in this class with you guys, but um, I'm more than happy to help you work through things and answer any questions if I can help you. Okay. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. All right, you guys have a good night. You too. Thank you, everybody.